Welcome everyone to the first workshop of the ISD um, virtual forum on the hydrogen economy um, in collaboration with CCICED. Um, so good, every, every, good evening to everyone in Asia, particularly in China, where I know many people are dialing in from. Uh, good evening to people in Europe, or good afternoon to people in Europe, Africa, and good morning to North America. And thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you to all the speakers and panelists for participating in today's session, where we're going to talk about uh, the prospects for industrial production and consumption of hydrogen. Uh, my name's Richard Bridal. I'm a senior policy uh, analyst with the uh, International Institute for Sustainable Development, where I work in the energy team. Um, I'm a specialist in energy subsidies, in uh, renewable energy, and also uh, I'm gradually becoming involved in this uh, exciting new prospect of, of hydrogen. Um, so I'll, I'll be moderating today's session. And before I get um, stuck into that, just a few housekeeping announcements. Um, so there's gonna be a Q and A um, at the end of the session. So I'd invite all the participants to, um, to use the Q and A function throughout the session. And that means that you may wish to um, ask a question of a particular speaker, in which case you could indicate that in the question. We'll gather them all together and we'll pose them to the, quest to the, to the um, speakers at the end. You may also wish to ask a more general question, in which case um, we'll kind of ask a few of the speakers their positions or views on, the, on those questions later on. Um, we're also gonna have a poll, uh, which I'm going to enable now. So, um, we'll, I'll just, you can, um, you can see the question. So it's just about which emerging hydrogen supply or demand technologies will become major markets for hydrogen. Uh, so you can, you can vote in that poll throughout the whole session. Um, so I'll just kind of leave that running and you can vote at any time throughout the, um, and, and we'll use that to prompt our discussion at the end. So, um, in, by way of introduction to the subject, um, I just wanted to say that we're talking about hydrogen today, as we have been for the rest for the forum which started yesterday, um, because of a number of, of large macro trends that are playing out in the sector. So the, the first one that is that existing markets for hydrogen are growing. The principal markets for hydrogen are for use in, uh, in <clears throat> refining, in oil refining, where hydrogen is used in a number of processes, including to uh, reduced sulfur content and diesel. Demand for low sulfur fuels has led to increased demand for hydrogen. Uh, also for ammonia, which is an input for fertilizer, which is uh, in which use has been growing as other industrial uses too, and increasingly perhaps uh, other uses beyond that. Second, it's because there is an, a steady increase in the other uses that hydrogen is being considered for. Um, there's much speculation about how these markets might develop in future. So these include anything that's been previously powered by fossil fuels. So we heard yesterday about um, the uh, work in Sweden on producing um, hydrogen from, uh, from steel from hydrogen uh, without the use of, use of fossil fuels in the process at all. Uh, I think that's just a, one amongst many examples of the potential of this technology. Um, by 2018, uh, the demand for pure hydrogen was around 70 million tonnes a year. By 2050, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Focus estimate that could grow by 10 times to nearly 700 million tons a year. So in this session, we're going to hear from experts around the world on how industrial production and consumption of hydrogen are developing in their respective markets. Um, and I'm very uh, pleased to introduce the, 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 uh, the speakers today. We've got Mark Zucrias, the senior, senior analyst at Clean Energy Canada, an ex-deputy minister at the um, British Columbia Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. We have Professor Michael B. McElroy, uh, the Gilbert Butler Professor of Environmental Studies at Harvard University. We also have uh, Sam Perez, um, the hydrogen and heat leader at Iberdrola Innovation Department, uh, based at Iberdrola in Spain. We have uh, Mr. Dang Yanbao, Chairman of the Ningxia Baofang Group, a leading uh, producer of hydrogen technologies in, based in China. And we also have Monica Nagashimi, a policy analyst um, based in Japan. Um, so um, without too much further 
ado, I'll just make one further announcement, which is that following this session, there is another session on transport, which you access via a different link. We, we've done that so you can, so we can, we can run right up to the end of our time and then you can switch over to their session while they can get ready in that meeting room. So I'll put the link up for that in the, um, I'll put the link up to remind you where that is at the end of the session. But also if you've received the, the, the web, website links, you should, um, you should be able to access that via the meeting request. So um, I'll remind you of the details of that at the end of the session, but it does mean we have a hard deadline of it's, it's two or 2.06 in Europe at the moment in Geneva. Um, so 3.30, so an hour and a half from now, we'll end the session kind of come what may in order that people can get to the second session. So without further ado, I'd like to hang, hand over to Mark Zacharias um, from Clean Energy Canager. So welcome, Mark. The floor is yours. If you'd like to introduce yourself and your presentation, um, be a very warm welcome to the, to the webinar. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I'm just uh, sharing my screen here. Let me know if you see it. There we go. Um, I won't take much time, but what I am going to be doing today is just providing a bit of setup and context for some of the future speakers that will follow me. I've got about 10 slides. And if there's any questions or comments, be happy to answer after, or anyone can find me offline. And I'll have my email at the end of the presentation. So um, just a couple of slides to set the context here, depending on who you ask and how it's calculated, the industrial sector is responsible for up to about 33% of global anthropogenic GHG emissions. That is if you count indirect emissions. So even without indirect emissions, industry is still responsible for about up to 19% of global GHGs. Now emissions per output, uh, per unit output in some cases have dropped significantly. For example, energy intensity of the European chemicals industry has declined by about 55% since 1991. Um, overall, industrial emissions globally continue to rise. So the takeaway here is that industry has a large carbon footprint and it's not shrinking in absolute terms. So the climate objective for industry is to reduce emissions from industrial operations while industry continues to supply the transformational technologies and infrastructure that the world needs. Now, Richard spoke a little bit about this, so I'll just, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but just a quick refresher on the current hydrogen production and use for context and the frame up the opportunity. Um, as was just said, about a 70 million annual tons of hydrogen are produced at a cost of around 830 megatons of CO2 emissions annually. Um, just for reference, this is more than the entire annual GHG emission of Canada and equivalent to the energy required by about 100 million US households. Um, the reason for these high emissions is that nearly all of this hydrogen is what is termed gray hydrogen, where CO2 is allowed to escape into the atmosphere when produced. And on the use side, so the graphic on the right, um, hydrogen is used in ammonia production, so mostly for fertilizers, oil refinery, which is self-explanatory, and methanol production, which is foundational to the chemical industry. So as we just saw, current hydrogen production has significant GHG emissions, and there is an opportunity to significantly increase the production and use of low carbon hydrogen, or what we've been calling clean hydrogen, um, meaning low carbon intensity. As the costs of renewable energy continue to decline, clean hydrogen can contribute to industrial decarbonization, uh, both as direct fuel and chemical feedstock. So as we saw in the previous slide, Hydrogen produced from fossil fuels is generally termed gray hydrogen, um, but clean hydrogen can take two forms. So blue hydrogen is made from either natural gas or coal with steam methane reforming or gasification and uses carbon capture and storage to capture and process emissions. So, I mean, the good thing right now is that blue hydrogen prices are starting to drop. Um, hydrogen prices at around one point, but $1.50 per kilogram in the Middle East in the US around $1.60 US in Russia, and around $2.40 per kilogram in Europe and China. Um, green hydrogen is, um, prices are starting to drop as well, and it's produced from renewable electricity sources through e e electrolysis. Uh, current costs for green hydrogen are around two and a half to $6 per kilogram. 
Uh, future costs, we think will be reduced to around two to four dollars per kilogram, somewhere between now and 2030. And that's shown on the figure on the left. Um, the cost of producing green hydrogen is projected to be on par with blue hydrogen by about 2030 and cheaper thereafter. The real interesting fact here is that green hydrogen is likely to be cheaper than natural gas by 2050. Now the graph on the right shows the carbon intensity between gray, blue, and green hydrogen. Uh, note that blue hydrogen, even with carbon capture and storage, still has a carbon footprint uh, because CCS is currently only around 80% efficient. So therefore there is a rationale to use blue hydrogen as a transition to green hydrogen as renewable power costs decline. Um, a little bit more on the clean hydrogen and the differentiation between blue and green. Uh, the graphs on this slide show that blue and green hydrogen production is increasing and 10 nations currently have clean hydrogen strategies and blue and green hydrogen production is, is expected to scale up dramatically over the next decade. Uh, the EU has the most ambitious hydrogen agenda with the goal of 40 gigawatts of green hydrogen capacity by 2040. And all of this is happening fairly quickly. In the last two weeks, uh, Spain has announced a plan to produce four gigawatts of green hydrogen by 2030 that's intended to fuel industrial processes and transportation. And last week, if you were uh, paying attention, Australia announced uh, a 15 gigawatt wind solar installation in Western Australia, and it will produce green hydrogen that will be converted to ammonia and uh, for shipping overseas. And one other kind of setup slide here, and I won't go through these in great detail, other than to point out that the graph on the left, um, that global hydrogen is expected to soar. The yellow color is the industrial hydrogen. And while many talk of hydrogen's capability to reduce emissions in the transportation sector, uh, which is a large opportunity, the opportunity in the industrial sector is not far behind. Again, you can see that on the graph on the right with the yellow color there. That's 2030 starting and then 27 at the end of the sequence. So just getting into a couple of examples around how to use clean hydrogen, uh, we'll start with steel. Uh, steel production is an excellent candidate for decarbonization through hydrogen. And as you can see from the graph, most of the world's steel production is pretty carbon intensive. Um, most steel is still produced by a blast furnace or basic oxygen furnace, and the resulting steel has a carbon intensity averaging around 2.8 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. Um, this can be reduced, reduced a little bit um, using the direct iron reducing process and electric arc furnace, which still produce around one ton of CO2 per ton of steel. And there is a growing global demand for low or zero carbon steel. Um, for example, Volkswagen and Toyota both aim to eliminate carbon emissions completely from their entire value chains, including their suppliers, and taking on full life cycle perspective. So carbon-free steel will be a big part of this. So I won't get too into the weeds, but there's generally two ways to use clean hydrogen in steel production. Uh, the first is to use hydrogen as an alternative to coal and coke to improve the performance of conventional blast furnaces. So that's the blue area on the graph. Um, however, while the injection of clean hydrogen into blast furnaces can reduce carbon emissions by up to 20%, uh, this does not often carbon, not offer carbon neutral emissions um, for steel because regular coking coal is still necessary reag still a necessary reagent in the blast furnace. Um, second, hydrogen can be used and as an alternative to natural gas to produce direct reduced iron that can be further processed into steel using an electric arc furnace. So based on the use of green hydrogen, as well as a renewable electricity from wind, solar or water, a uh, dry EAF setup uh, enables nearly carbon neutral steel production. Um, pretty much all European steel players right now are currently building or are already testing uh, hydrogen based steel processes. Um, probably the one that's best known right now is the hybrid, hybrid process, uh, which has completed feasibility studies. And as Richard indicated, uh, Swedish Steel intends to convert all of their plants to fossil free steel production by 2040. Um, the last thing I'll say on this slide is steel making using hydrogen as a chemical reducing agent uh, would be competitive in a region with a carbon price around $45 to $75 a ton, assuming electricity costs around five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, one other quick example would be cement. Um, cement production releases carbon dioxide through two main activities, 
energy use and calcination reactions. Uh, en energy related emissions are around 30% of direct CO2 emissions from cement production and therefore hydrogen could be a valuable energy source to avoid emissions. Um, cement's also unique compared to some other materials in that CO2 can be captured and sequestered in cement projects and cement products. And there are a number of kind of innovative cement projects around the world looking at decarbonization. And just to conclude, the, um, there are a number of things that need to happen in order to increase the production and use of hydrogen for industrial processes. Uh, first, governments need to commit to lowering the carbon intensity of industries. And this is best done through national hydrogen strategies. Uh, a previous slide indicated that there are about 10 national strategies and more are likely to come on stream in the coming months. Uh, second, governments need to support innovation, commercialization, and scaling up of new technologies to promote hydrogen as a industrial power source and feedstock. Um, third, governments need to link hydrogen producers with hydrogen users, likely regionally, and look for opportunities to link and increase supply and demand. Um, governments also have the opportunity to regulate the carbon intensity of facilities to incent them towards hydrogen, as well as, as, well as regulate the carbon intensity of, intensity of hydrogen production um, to transition from gray to blue to ultimately green hydrogen. And lastly, industries need to find ways to lower their carbon intensity of their processes and make commitments to their ESG goals. Um, lastly, there's an opportunity for industries to seek out new markets for low carbon products and price premiums. So with that, I think I'm about at the end of my 10 minutes and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mark. That's uh, a, a very uh, uh, fitting introduction and I'm very pleased to, to have, have that. I think that's uh, told us a lot about some of the key sectors. Hopefully we'll hear some more about those. So now I'd like to pass over to Professor Michael B. McElroy um, from Harvard University. Um, I believe that uh, one of our, someone else is gonna share the screen there. Um, so I think one of our IISD CCICD team is going to share the screen. Yep, we have a presentation. And Professor McElroy, are you are you are you ready to speak now? No, I'm ready to go. Thank you. Perfect. Well, in that case, the floor is yours. And thank you, um, thank you very much. Thank you. So what I'm what I'm going to do uh, is to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, we we have going on here at Harvard. And if I could just uh, show the first uh, slide. So can I control the slides? Well, th this is a, really a repeat of what we just heard a little bit. Uh, production of hydrogen uh, by electrolysis can provide an opportunity to compensate for fluctuations in power from renewable sources. I'm gonna say a little bit more about this. I mean, what, one, of the, um, one of the issues with, uh, with wind and solar is that we have to compensate in some way for the variability of those sources. And that's a real challenge. Uh, and, but there is, there's adequate sources globally of both wind and either wind or solar to essentially satisfy all of the energy demands that we can imagine. But we have to be able to uh, find a way to compensate for their variability. And also, <laughs> as uh, the previous speaker uh, talked about, uh, the opportunity to use Hydrogen as a low carbon source in transportation is pretty important as well. And so let me get, go to the next slide. The, the study if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. The particular study that uh, I'll say a little bit about here is one that we did in uh, Western Indian Mongolia in Northern China. And the background here is that um, China has um, more installed wind power than any other country in the world, number one. Number two, um, there is a problem with curtailment of wind, wind resources uh, during the winter, particularly in the northern region of China. The background here is that there's a requirement for heat for, for buildings and for, for homes in winter that is conventionally supplied largely from um, combined heat and coal-fired power plants. So at a time when the wind is really blowing and it's cold, the problem is that the wind turbines are often turned off uh, because you have to have this source of uh, district water to, to heat the houses in, in, the, in the region. 
And so this, uh, this, this leads to a significant financial loss and also significant inefficiency. Um, the financial loss is estimated to be around over a billion dollars between 2010 and 2016. And so then the question is, how can we compensate for this particular uh, problem? So what we have been thinking about is um, the opportunity to uh, use the uh, wind generated electricity to produce hydrogen by electrolysis. And there are two uh, parts of the study that we did. Number one is to imagine just using curtailed electricity on the wind farms. And of course, under those circumstances, effectively the, the price of the electricity is zero and you can produce, uh, you know, obviously relatively cheap electricity, a relatively cheap hydrogen from so otherwise curtailed uh, power. But the more interesting study, part of the study, as it turns out, is that the opportunity to use both curtailed electricity and um, uh, electricity from the grid to produce hydrogen. Uh, and under, under those circumstances, what we have looked at is the opportunity to produce as much hydrogen as is currently uh, consumed uh, by industrial sources in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 China and, and specifically in Inner Mongolia. So the the conclusion of, of that particular part of the study is that you're able to use the electrolysis system more efficiently, electrolysis systems more efficiently, because the the, the capacity factor can be uh, closer to 100 percent. You can be running it essentially all the time using grid electricity when the curtailed electricity is not uh, available. And the study that we did said, okay, we want to see what are the opportunities to produce uh, hydrogen at a cost that is less than, we pick $2 per kilowatt hour as, as, our, uh, as our target. And uh, let's see, have I, have you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, so the the, the target we, we picked was to use uh, two dollars as the as the benchmark. 那么我们现在使用两美元作为一个基准. So our conclusion is that in fact you can produce uh, uh, much of the current uh, hydrogen demand in this particular area using using uh, using uh, wind wind generated uh, electricity, and you can do that in a cost competitive way. Obviously, um, the applications that we have in mind here are some that, that were, were discussed in the previous talk. Uh, opportunity to use hydrogen in the iron and steel industry is a very significant thing. Opportunity to use hydrogen as a substitute for, uh, for uh, fossil fuel generated hydrogen in production of uh, fertilizer and methanol production are, are all significant uh, opportunities. So um, this uh, study continues. Uh, we also have, um, I can just uh, go to the next slide. So this is a, just a summary of what I've been talking about here, electrolysis as a source of green hydrogen. The other issue just to, to point to make here is that of course, um, the electrolysis system is also gonna provide source of, uh, of essentially pure oxygen and that has some market value as well. And we consider that in our, in our particular uh, study. Um, we also, next slide. This is simply a, a summary of, of uh, this particular paper that I'm sort of alluding to uh, briefly, which is currently under review in the Journal of Applied Energy. And you can see the, the, the range of authors here. So this is a specific study looking at, uh, at uh, China and looking at spe specifically at uh, Western Inner Mongolia for this particular uh, issue. Now, the, 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 the question of using hydrogen seems to me is, is a broader issue indeed. As I mentioned at the beginning, the key issue in using renewable energy sources such as wind and solar is how to compensate for the variability of those sources. And um, the, the, the traditional way of doing that is to take advantage of uh, batteries, for example, or pumped hydro or compressed air. But most of those sources are essentially uh, opportunities to store electricity over relatively short periods of time. Pumped hydro is relatively inexpensive and relatively efficient. Batteries are getting uh, more, more efficient and, more, uh, and, and cheaper as time goes along. 
But the, the really interesting opportunity, I think, is to store excess electricity when you have it available from wind and solar in the form of hydrogen, and then to find creative ways of using that hydrogen uh, to compensate for what would otherwise be fossil fuel sources. So I think there's a real opportunity to use hydrogen as a means to, uh, to deal with the variability of the, uh, of the wind and solar uh, sources. We also have been looking at this uh, particular issue in the context of uh, India, uh, as, well as, in, uh, as well as China. And I might mention that uh, part of the reason that, uh, that the hydrogen produced, the green hydrogen, I, I think can be cost competitive is because the cost of electricity from wind and solar is becoming very, very cheap. Uh, and, and, and continued, continued, the costs continue to decline. So using um, a hydrogen produced from a relatively inexpensive wind source or a solar source gives you a, a, a potential uh, to be competitive with the otherwise uh, the production from either coal or natural gas. In the case of China, in the case of Inner Mongolia, a significant part of the production of industrial hydrogen comes from coal. And as we, as we know, that has associated with it a very high uh, emission of uh, associated emission of CO2. And so again, in the China context, there are interesting opportunities, which we've also talked about, to produce electricity from offshore wind cost competitively. Traditionally, uh, electricity in uh, China has been produced from coal. The coal has been mined in northern China, shipped by rail to the coast, then shipped by, uh, to uh, where the coal-fired power plants are in Shanghai or in other coastal industrial areas. But we, what we found out recently is that there's the opportunity to produce uh, electricity cost competitively from offshore sources. This is essentially using technology that's been de developed mostly in Europe, which has led the way in offshore uh, 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 wind production, using, uh, using waters which have a, a, a depth of less than 50 or 50 meters or 60 meters. The advantage for China is that China has abundant um, relatively shallow water in its off coast region up to the economic zone and the opportunity to produce more than enough electricity from that particular source to satisfy the current energy demands in the coastal cities of China and curiously and interestingly enough the opportunity to again compensate for the variability of those sources by using else as a source of significant source of hydrogen. The, the other uh, final issue that I wanted to mention is that um, in developing the hydrogen economy, uh, I think that we have the opportunity to, as the previous speaker did uh, talk about, to reduce current industrial sources of CO2, which are very significant. We have the opportunity to perhaps uh, uh, use uh, fuel cells uh, for long distance transport in, uh, in the transportation sector. We have the opportunity to um, to perhaps use it also as a way to compensate for the variability of uh, renewable sources uh, such as wind and solar. But the other intriguing opportunity I think is that if I think about it in, in a US or, or in a, a North American context, the United States is now becoming uh, a, a essentially a major exporter of natural gas and of uh, and indeed of oil and petroleum products, largely, largely taking advantage of the cheap sources that we're getting from uh, the fracking industry. And so it's, it's clear that um, export of, uh, of fossil fuels in the form of either, coal, either natural gas or uh, oil becomes a significant uh, economic uh, 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 challenge and, and economic opportunity for the United States. I think the interesting thing to think about also is the possibility that countries that have abundant sources of renewable energy and the opportunity to produce green hydrogen could in fact become major exporters of, uh, of uh, renewable of green hydrogen, either in the form of hydrogen or perhaps in the form of ammonia. And I think that's an opportunity that we should uh, think about also as we proceed with, uh, with this uh, very interesting uh, uh, symposium, very interesting series of talks. So I think I've probably used my 10 minutes. And uh, so let me stop at this point and, uh, and hand back uh, to our chair. Thank you very much, Professor McElroy. That was a fascinating uh, presentation and really interesting to understand some of the potential, particularly in China, and also I think the idea of um, enabling so much deployment of offshore wind is really a potentially transformative change to the energy system. So next, without further ado, I'd like to move on to um, 
to uh, Mr. Dang Yangbao. He'll, he'll be joining us via simultaneous uh, translation. So if you find yourself getting the Chinese feed, just be aware that you can switch between languages uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can switch between English and Chinese. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Dang to take mm -hmm. to the floor. Mm -hmm. and the floor is yours. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. So please proceed with your presentation. Hey, uh, distinguished guests and dear friends, greetings to you from China. My name is Dang Yan Bao. I come from Ningxia Baofeng Group. I'm chairman of the uh, group. The company is located in Western China. I'm very honored to be invited uh, to attend this virtual forum on the hydrogen economy. And I will talk about the development of hydrogen industry and Baofeng efforts. And I welcome your, your comments and feedback because uh, climate change is a challenge confronting in the entire mankind. It is a mission shared by all human beings. China is an important player and uh, part participant, contributor, and a leader in this regard. Replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy is one of the most important ways to address climate change. All countries in the world are actively uh, promoting the use and uh, demonstration of uh, applying new energy sources in transportation industry and energy storage, etc. And my company, Baofeng um, Energy Group, is uh, aimed at becoming a socially responsible company and we adhere to the development philosophy of modern industrial development and new energy and green development. And we, at this moment, we are actively developing new approaches to replacing fossil energies with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a clean, efficient, non-polluting, safe, energy that has promising future. Hydrogen is usually produced in two pathways. First, use fossil fuels or industrial byproduct gas to produce hydrogen. However, there, the problem is there's carbon emission in the process. And second pathway is to use renewable energies to produce hydrogen, which is green green hydrogen and uh, countries around the world after many years of research and innovation have greatly advanced the development of green hydrogen with more mature uh, technologies and uh, lowering uh, gradually lowering cost so the hydrogen industry uh, is uh, coming in the future and hydrogen can replace fossil energies in, in the future. And our company is uh, located in a region with rich solar energy. We have innovated and created a national level demonstration base for hydrogen production and storage by application of uh, the solar power and water electrolysis. So this is our flagship demonstration project. We have applied the world's most advanced technology and equipment and created a complete green hydrogen production process line with the optimal combination of solar power generation plus electrolyzed water hydrogen. So that as a result, the purity of our hydrogen production reaches international standards and the cost 
is kept at the lowest level in the world. And we strive to build a hydrogen production project with the world's largest scale, the highest conversion rate, the lowest energy cost, and most extensive uh, demonstration application in the world. The project has started in April this year and is scheduled to be completed and put into production by the end of this year. So we um, utilize the solar power in the process and we use the most advanced solar power generation technology. This kind of solar power generation is 20% more efficient than other technologies. So this is a light tracking technology, 20% more efficient than traditional uh, photovoltaic power generation, generating 160 million kilowatt hour electricity per year. So this is the core strength of the project to use this highly efficient solar power generation to produce hydrogen. So the, sol uh, the hydrogen can be used widely in other industries. So we have put into place um, electro electrolyzer, the high efficiency alkaline electrolyzer that is the most advanced in the world. And the overall hydrogen production can produce 100 million cubic meters of hydrogen per year. And the cost is controlled below or around 1.54 uh, RMB or Chinese Yuan per cubic meter. It is among the lowest in China and in the world for green hydrogen. So we have developed advanced technologies, equipment, innovations to achieve these uh, great results. And we're also thankful for the sufficient solar power in our in this region in Western China. In terms of the use of hydrogen, mainly in three ways, uh, we use green hydrogen as a clean energy and also in industry, transportation, and other areas. So hydrogen can replace fossil fuels in smaller uh, applications. And because it can be a decentralized distribution, it can play an important role in replacing fossil fuels in a variety of projects. So we as a company must contribute to social development and receive and achieve social benefits. So we, uh, so this is how we are differentiated from others in the market. With hydrogen as a source, there are so many uh, applications that we have already developed. And uh, last but not the least, we call on all parties to take active actions and 
participate in the R&D of the technology and relevant practices so as to contribute to the clean energy revolution. And the cost is very competitive, actually. At least in China, we have achieved very competitive uh, cost. So this is definitely a irreversible trend for hydrogen to replace traditional energy sources. So this is something we need to work towards as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Dang Yangbao. That was a fascinating presentation from uh, one of the companies that's on the cutting edge of developing hydrogen technologies and also deploying plants that are looking at the production, the uh, generation of electricity to power the processes, and looking increasingly to transport and market the hydrogen itself. So involved all the way through the production, the value chain. So that's a fascinating insight. From that example, we move uh, to a, another example of, of real industrial hydrogen production that's, that's in, in process, and that's with Iberdrola. So if I can invite uh, Sam Perez uh, from the, the hydrogen and heat leader for Iberdrola Innovation Department to talk through uh, what Iberdrola are thinking regarding hydrogen and developing uh, in Europe. So um, Sam, are you there? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Well, um, most of the of the subject in relation to, with industrial hydrogen has already been commented, but uh, this uh, just stress the interest of hydrogen in in the industry. Just a, just a couple of words to situate Iberdrola. Iberdrola is one of the utilities, uh, huge utilities in the world. Uh, we have an installed capacity over uh, 52,000 megawatts. 62% uh, of that uh, installed capacity is uh, emissions free. So our bet for the renewable energy is uh, really clear. We are more than 30,000 employees, and we just start business in the last few months in Australia, Japan, and Sweden, a part of the classical uh, geographical areas of Iberdrola, Spain as a, a mother loan, and then uh, UK, uh, Mexico, and the States. Um, when we go into the, um, into the hydrogen value chain, it's important to take into account that the cost of production hydrogen is just one of the contents of the, of the final delivery price. Storage, transport and distribution, and final the efficiency in the use are things to be taken into account. It's just, just a, a refresh. This time we are talking just about production and in an industrial environment. If we and um, more or less, this has been already commented by, by the previous speakers, but uh, just as I remember, uh, something between 70 and 80 million tons of uh, hydrogen are produced every year in, uh, in its pure form. That is directly from the, from the source. And this source is 70%, 75% natural gas and oil, and something like 24% from coal. Electricity is 1%, uh, 2% if uh, we follow the reference of our former speaker, but at similar, similar figures. All of this is producing more than 800 million tons of CO2 emitted to the atmosphere every year. And this is just to have a reference, uh, a part of uh, Canada reference that is a very good reference, this is exactly the emissions of Germany as a country. So in any case, uh, one reference or the other, it represents a huge amount of emissions to the atmosphere every year. And a part of these uh, uses uh, directly related of uh, hydrogen as a feedstock uh, for refinery, ammonia production, 
and of course after the ammonia we will produce fertilizers and uh, the chemical industry we have another this will be in our opinion this will be the first step to decarbonize the hydrogen production second step is that sectors that are usually are called hard to electrify sectors these are representing around 15 percent of final energy demand in any case both uh, both phases the feedstock the hydrogen as a feedstock and the hard to electrify sectors are uh, an opportunity for the growing of renewables that is, at the end this is the business of a uh, utility like Iberdrola so we want to assure that the hydrogen is produced from renewable sources because uh, one of the main issues is to avoid the CO2 emissions. This is not uh, easy as the, um, as the final price of the green hydrogen is still uh, much expensive than the, the let's call a gray hydrogen from natural gas. These are some figures uh, for the world, for Europe and specifically for Spain about the, the hydrogen demand. If we look uh, specifically to Spain, we are producing and consuming about uh, half a million tons of uh, hydrogen per year. And let's say 20, 25% of this hydrogen is consumed in the ammonia industry. We are specifically stressing the, the production of ammonia because we think uh, probably the refinery industry will go down in the demand because uh, the demand of uh, fuel for transportation will be decreased. Uh, let's think in just the amount of diesel fuel that is uh, mm, uh, demanded every year that is decreasing, but we think uh, fertilizer will be necessary to feed the the population all over the world. There are other sectors, industrial sectors that could use uh, hydrogen like glass, electronics uh, or steel that has already been, been commented in, in this uh, panel. At the end, our focus uh, will be in the, in the ammonia um, production using green hydrogen. Uh, which is the, the start position for all of this. In Europe, we have uh, just 56 megawatts of electrolyzers installed. It's, a, it's an amount of, uh, of it's a capacity very, very small. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there has been announced in, in Europe by 2030, we should have 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers. That is a, a huge increase in the in the installed power of, of these kind of facilities. So um, there is an opportunity here for, for producing green hydrogen. Uh, and as we think the first step is to decarbonize the already the, the, the present production of hydrogen, we decided to check if it is possible to produce green ammonia by means of uh, electrolytic uh, hydrogen. That's the reason we propose a project in Puerto Llano where there is a fertilizer fac facility uh, from a company called Fertiberia. Fertiberia will be a, our off-taker and thanks to them, it's possible to think in this project because uh, we are not obliged to look for, for potential clients for the production of hydrogen in our installation. Um, yeah, this is this is just to to have a reference about the prices of, of hydrogen. The, the hydrogen produced from natural gas using the SMEER process is in somewhere between one and two euros per kilo. In if we think in using green hydrogen. The, in this case, the price is somewhere between five and nine. Of course, this is not competitive at all. For, for these initial projects, uh, some kind of help in the form of subsidies are necessary to increase the, the, 
the scale and uh, to have more and more electrolyzers uh, run uh, running and um, looking for uh, lower prices. But our expectations, our prospective analysis uh, show us that a price around two or something in the middle and between two and three could be feasible. And if we take into account that the natural gas could go up and the, um, especially the cost of CO2 could increase, we think it's possible to, to be competitive against the gray hydrogen by the end of the decade. This is, this is our expectation and this is the reason we have entered into the, into the hydrogen business. Our project, just a short description, is a, is a 20 megawatt, um, uh, sorry, but the, the screen is, uh, okay, yeah. It's a 20 megawatt electrolyzer, 100% uh, fit with renewables because we, we are going to build uh, very close a 100 megawatt uh, photovoltaic power plant using uh, new technologies like bifacial pan uh, panels and streaming versors, so, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We are going to install together with this photovoltaic installation a battery system of uh, 5 megawatts uh, for four hours. That means 20 megawatt hour extra energy. That is about one hour every day of extra energy to produce uh, hydrogen. Um, the, um, the project can be seen in this sketch. This is a very simple sketch, but the idea is uh, to uh, transport the electricity through a dedicated line directly to the electrolyzer that will be inside the fertilizer uh, facility. So we are not uh, obliged to, to transport, compress and manage the, the hydrogen and also the oxygen uh, that will be valued in the, for the, another process inside the, the fertilizer facility in the production of nitric acid. So at the end, uh, we will be able to reduce the CO2 emissions in a very important amount. Um, the expected production of the 20 megawatt, if we just thinking in using 35 uh, megawatts of photovoltaics, that is the, the allocated uh, portion of the power plant uh, directly uh, allocated to the to electrolyzer, it's uh, over 700 tons per year. But if we are able to sign PPA agreements um, and get electricity, renewable electricity from other sources or for the rest of these uh, photovoltaic installations, we will be able to reach um, uh, at a competitive uh, price or let's say at a price similar to, to the photovoltaic installation associated with the electrolyzer of about uh, 1,200 tons per year of uh, green hydrogen production. Um, all of this uh, hydrogen will be used by the Fertiveria facility and we have uh, plans once this pilot, uh, we, this, this demo uh, will demonstrate is, uh, is uh, proper working, uh, the increase in the electrolyzer um, capacity to feed the Fertiveria facility. Just to finish, this is a sketch that could be found in our in our web page. So I don't know, I do not stop here, but it is all the figures related to the to the production of oxygen and hydrogen can be can be seen here. Um, yes, uh, other figures. The total amount of investment is around 150 million euros. Take into account not only the, the investment of our company, of Iberdrola, but also some uh, process modification that uh, will be performed in the Fertiveria facility. We expect to create around 700 uh, local jobs in the, in the life of the, of the facility, and the total avoided emissions will be close to 40,000 tons of CO2 per year. And this is not only because of the production of green hydrogen, but also 
in the avoiding uh, emissions of the less natural gas that will be used in the, in the Fertiberia facility. And also we are going to reduce the production on N2O, that is a greenhouse gas with an important effect and will be largely uh, decreased. Uh, yes, um, and this is just a sketch of the, of the real and the physical situation of the, of the facility. Uh, we have the photovoltaic area. This is a wire of about 12 kilometers to communicate the electricity production facility with the electrolyzer that is inside the Fertiberia facility. Uh, just to finish, uh, Iberdrola has um, committed with the green hydrogen and has just created one month ago uh, a specific direction for green hydrogen uh, with a global scope. We have um, just starting with the direction but there is uh, people in Spain working on this, people in UK and people in the States looking for projects of green hydrogen to be able to fulfill the, the needs of our clients in, the, in terms of, uh, of low carbon hydrogen. Um, I think that that's all. I'm happy to, to answer your questions at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. So that was an incredibly detailed presentation and I am very pleased that there's so many, so much data in that and so many numbers. I'm sure that a lot of the researchers listening will be uh, very happy to, to kind of have some of those data points and to understand the economics of the project so well, um, particularly um, the impact of, of how, you, how you put it that um, the, it's currently not, not viable without capital subsidy for the uh, electrolyzers but that will that's changing over time um, mm -hmm. I'd just like to remind everyone as well that um, you can ask questions through the Q&A function and we're, we're currently coordinating all of them and we'll be putting it to the panel very soon uh, there's still also the poll uh, that you can fill in if you haven't already on, on what you think the, the major uh, end users and technologies will be um, so please do that and now we're going to move to our last speaker. Um, I have to apologize to, to uh, Monica uh, Nagashima for kind of getting her position wrong in the, in the original introduction. She is, in fact, of course, the engagement manager at JETI, which is the Jap Japan Energy Transition Initiative. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Monica to the, uh, to the forum and to the webinar and uh, pass the floor over to you uh, for your presentation on, on uh, hydrogen use and trade in Japan. So thank you very much, Monica. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank the IISD for organizing this forum and for giving me the opportunity to share some points on hydrogen use and trade in Japan. The basic hydrogen strategy was announced in December 2017 in response to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's request for a plan to transform Japan into a world leading hydrogen society. The strategy brought together public and private hydrogen initiatives that have been going on for decades and identified hydrogen as a carbon free source of energy that could address uh, Japan's energy concerns. Since then, Japan has continued to promote hydrogen in various ways and um, just yesterday, um, there was a pledge by Prime Minister Suga to make Japan carbon neutral by 2050. So that is likely to create further momentum. A few key aspects of Japan's current strategy. Um, so a broad range of technologies are covered, uh, different types of production, transportation, and, and use. And the overarching theme is cost competitiveness of hydrogen with conventional systems. The Japanese strategy is import focused, and I will explain why a bit later in my presentation. Um, so several carrier technologies are being pursued right now, and Japan aims to pioneer international trade of hydrogen and ammonia, much like what we see with LNG and uh, oil trade around the world. And uh, under Japan's strategy, hydrogen will be decarbonized in the long term using both renewables and fossil fuels with CCUS, though the timeline is so far unclear. 
There are many detailed costs and dissemination targets for various uses. I will give a brief overview. Two of Japan's automakers, Toyota and Honda, have developed fuel cell passenger cars. So there's a considerable push for that sector. And there is growing uptake for fuel cell buses, forklifts, and uh, trucks, as well as uh, plans to develop prototypes of hydrogen and ammonia powered ships this decade. Many companies are developing stationary fuel cells that provide heat and power for residential and industrial use. There are also a number of projects using hydrogen and ammonia in thermal power plants. For now, blending with natural gas or coal with long-term plans for commercial scale-up. And uh, industry, which I'll cover on the next slide. So a notable difference with uh, perhaps the European strategy and some of the others is that industrial applications are not a priority in the Japanese hydrogen strategy. Virtually all hydrogen today in Japan is a byproduct of some industrial process, as was explained by previous speakers. Uh, in Japan, 70% uh, is emitted and reused within oil refining for desulfurization. The caustic soda and steel making industries are among a few of these suppliers also. Decarbonizing hydrogen feedstock or using it as a fuel is supported as long as it becomes cost competitive. And officially that appears to be after 2030. As a reference, the current cost of hydrogen feedstock for oil refining is around 23, 27 cents per normal cubic meter, which is lower than the target cost for hydrogen for the next decade or so. While industry and manufacturing are excluded from any targets, uh, they are the highest emitter of CO2 in Japan. According to the IPCC pathways on 1.5 degrees, hydrogen will have to play a considerable role as a substitute for fossil fuels in industry. Today, hydrogen is available at uh, fuel stations for about $1 per cubic meter. Um, the supply cost target for 2030 is about 30 cents and in the long term around 20 cents, so about one fifth of the current price. The roadmap states that the economics of hydrogen will improve if the environmental value, or essentially carbon pricing, is uh, reflected in the energy market. The world's largest 10 megawatt alkaline electrolyzer powered by 20 megawatts of solar power began operating in Fukushima in March of this year, and uh, electrolyzers are one of the um, key R&D uh, segments in Japan. But there are two challenges to scaling up domestic hydrogen production or um, clean production. The first being the high cost of electrolyzers. On average, at the moment, around $2,000 per kilowatt. While around the world, I believe um, some costs around 1,000 or even 500 have already been reported. The second challenge is the high cost of renewable electricity. At roughly 12 cents, Solar power is about two times more expensive than in Europe. And at 19 cents, onshore wind is about three times higher uh, in Japan. So this appears to have created a preference for overseas projects. And as you can see on the graph here, uh, the IEA estimates that even in 2030, it will be cheaper to import hydrogen from, or ammonia made from electrolysis in Australia than producing it in Japan even taking into account the shipping and reconversion costs. So given this, uh, Japanese companies are developing several marine carrier technologies for the transportation of hydrogen, including liquefaction, organic hydrides, and ammonia. Uh, pictured here, um, this is liquid hydrogen. At the end of this year, Kawasaki Heavy Industries uh, with a consortium called Hystra is expected to complete the construction of the world's first liquefied hydrogen carrier ship, which will be used to transport hydrogen produced from brown coal in Australia to Japan. It is worth noting that hydrogen production from coal emits two times more CO2 emissions than production from natural gas. And as the previous speaker has mentioned, CCS can capture about 80% of these emissions and is expected to be introduced at some later point, but it is not part of the current pilot project. 
Um, Kyoto Corporation launched the demonstration of shipping of methyl cyclohexane or MCH, an organic hydride from uh, which will be shipped from Brunei to Japan. Uh, in May of this year, the hydrogen extracted from this hydride was successfully used as fuel and gas power generation. And then um, the tolian was sent back to Brunei, thus completing the full circle. Separately, Chiyoda, together with other Japanese and Australian partners, reported some breakthrough in lowering the production costs for MCH using solar power last year. And uh, last month, Saudi Aramco, in partnership with the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, uh, demonstrated the production and shipment of blue ammonia from Saudi Arabia to Japan. Hydrogen was produced from natural gas and the CO2 was captured and reused in enhanced oil recovery and methanol production. Uh, just some points for discussion and uh, a wrap up. Uh, so Japan is undertaking a broad range of R&D and pilot projects covering various areas of production, use, and uh, it is trying to pioneer a hydrogen trade network. Other nations may also consider import and export of hydrogen for geographic and resource reasons, offering a potential area of cooperation and trade with Japan. But energy security concerns continue to be important to Japan, and it will be interesting to see how the domestic market will be developed. And in order to scale and commercialize these decarbonization technologies, um, the government and stakeholders will have to focus on creating a business case. It is to say, what is the reason for hydrogen? Of course, there are fuels we can buy and use already. We can drive our cars right now and we can produce our steel using conventional methods. And of course, the answer is that these processes must be decarbonized and very fast if we want to stay within safe warming limits. So while innovation and the technology race are important, in of itself, these will not uh, be enough to create a market. What's needed are institutional and economic mechanisms that promote decarbonization technologies for the entire economy, including hydrogen. And uh, meanwhile, we will be keeping an eye on Japan's concrete plans to net zero, and we'll be hoping they are aligned with scientific recommendations. And um, I thank everyone for their attention. Thank you very much, Monica. It's a, a very interesting and, and quite different um, set of priorities uh, in Japan with a much more of a focus on international trade. I think that's something that a lot of countries are, are interested in. Um, and will certainly be a big part of the discussion going forward. So now, before as we move to the Q and A, um, I just wanted to um, share the results of the poll we had. So um, here we can see that the of the respondents we had, um, the top uh, kind of end use or market for hydrogen is people think is going to be in steel production. I think that's a, that's some, uh, something a number of presenters mentioned. Also, we heard a lot today about ammonia, um, both in terms of the potential use for it relating to fertilizer, also perhaps it aids the, some of the transport, international transport that we heard about in Japan. And we haven't heard too much about heavy transport today, but luckily we have a session coming up right after this one in 20 minutes time, which is gonna look at just that. It's gonna look at tra um, heavy transport, but also, um, other transport as well, so passenger vehicles, even though the respondents to our poll are perhaps a little bit more skeptical about the potential for passenger vehicles um, to be powered by hydrogen. Um, the other issue we've heard quite a bit about today is energy storage, 45% of the, of the respondents think that's gonna be a, a big source of uh, demand for hydrogen going for your, forward. Um, we also haven't talked much about synthetic fuels, perhaps that'll come up in the transport session, um, but there's uh, some support for that as well. So while we 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 move to the Q and A session, um, what I'd ask the um, the presenters to do is just be ready to kind of pick up uh, any questions. You can either, if you wish to answer a question I'm posing, or or add something 
um, you can either kind of wait for a gap in the in the conversation and, and just butt in, or you can send a message via the chat that to kind of express to me that you you wish me to give you the floor, and I and I certainly will. But before we get onto that, I'll, I'll just ask a, um, uh, I'll just ask a start with a question to right back to our our first question uh, question to Mark. Um, Mark, you mentioned about the um, the carbon intensity of green, blue, and gray hydrogen being different. And I wondered how you think that that, that can be incorporated in, in uh, hydrogen markets. Like, do you think there is a, a mechanism that can be used to reward, to reflect the carbon intensity? To, or how do, how do you envisage that working? Um, well, I think there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, one is if you do have national or subnational climate targets, uh, you know, those would obviously skew towards cleaner sources of any fuel, including hydrogen. Um, I think we're seeing, we're starting to see across jurisdictions is regulating facility intensities and emission intensities by either sector or facility. And if that can be done, then facilities and companies will need to find sources of clean hydrogen and switch eventually from gray to blue to green. Um, you know, most companies now have ESG goals and those goals are going to require them to lower carbon uh, emissions overall, as well as the intensity per unit of production. And that's an opportunity to switch from blue to green as well. And then I think, um, as I alluded to, uh, if we can regionalize supply and demand hubs where you have green energy producing hydrogen that's used locally, where you don't have to have long transport distances, the economics scale up quite nicely for the use of blue and green hydrogen. So turning it over to others. Okay, does anyone else want to comment on the kind of the role of emissions factors? I, I think we had, it was interesting to hear from, well, both the industrial presentations from Mr. Um, Dang and from um, Ibadrola as well, talking specifically looking at green hydrogen. I wondered if they, you had any views on the economics uh, of grey hydrogen in the, in the short term, you mentioned it's a transition fuel to some extent. Is there? Would anyone like to elaborate on that? So perhaps Sam, if you're if you're available, you could just comment on Ibadrola's process of kind of committing to to green hydrogen going forward. Yeah, we we decided to go directly for the green hydrogen as uh, we think in ten years time the transition. Uh, will not be necessary. Uh, for example, if you invest in a huge uh, facility to capture your CO2 from a SMER uh, facility, uh, this is a huge uh, asset investment. Uh, if you go by the electrolyzer way, you can go module by module, install, for example, five, 10 or 20 megawatts and uh, increasing the installed uh, capacity for that power plant. At the same time that you are adapting the process, for example, in our case, in the, in the ammonia facility. So it will be uh, a smooth transition because you are increasing the electrolyzer capacity little by little. Uh, if you decide to invest in a carbon capture facility, this is a huge investment and probably uh, it's difficult to take this decision if in an eight or 10 years, uh, it will not be competitive if you compare to the, to the green hydrogen expectations. So uh, yeah. Yeah. on the business also. Yeah, so there is a, a potential risk of, of stranded assets associated with, with blue hydrogen. So, um, um, Mr. Dang, if, if you'd like to comment on any of these, and I'd also just like to add, so as well as uh, as well as the kind of um, the question around blue and green hydrogen and why you have seemed to have, have gone down the route of green hydrogen, I, I, I just wanted to reflect another couple of questions that came in. Uh, about you mentioned lots of the end uses that you were kind of considering or starting to use. And I wondered which of those are the ones that you personally feel are the most kind of significant and also which demand sources in Western are currently there for hydrogen in Western China that could be supplied from your pilot plant and, and the other plants you're planning. So uh, I don't know if we still have Mr. Dang on the line. 
if if you feel free to kind of so, sorry mr down just uh, to move into another meeting now <laughs> so okay fine we'll we'll move straight on then so the the other thing that i want to if, write, if you have uh, further questions maybe you can by email, we can yeah, let Mr. Down to answer the questions. Okay, no problem at all. I, I think we'll move on for now and we, and we thank him for his participation. It was fascinating. So in terms of the other, the other uh, another area that I think came up in a number of the presentations um, was the role of carbon pricing in turning some of these end uses and making them viable, and particularly the switch between blue and, and gray hydrogen, but also also just kind of some of the end uses that we're currently uh, are theoretical but aren't accounting for very significant volumes. Um, so I just I just wonder to what extent are are people seeing in their modeling the economic viability being changed by carbon pricing? And I, I just wanted to start with uh, Professor McElroy on on that. Um, when you've looked at um, the economics of um, of smoothing renewable energy demand, for example, um, is does carbon pricing play a role in those assumptions? Is it something you you think is going to be um, significant? So, I, I think I think the answer is uh, clearly yes. Um, but um, by way of background, uh, I think what's what is really impressive at the moment is the the fact that um, sources of electricity from wind in good areas and solar in other areas are actually becoming competitive with even without carbon pricing competitive with uh, fossil fuel uh, sources and i think that um, the interesting um, yeah, I, I was intrigued uh, by uh, the the uh, monica statement that uh, japan has now made a commitment to uh, to essentially carbon neutrality by 2020 2050 i think it was and you know, China has made a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2060, if not earlier. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, the, the things are changing in, in a major way. I think that carbon pricing would, would provide real advantages, but uh, even without carbon pricing, I think uh, we're, we're on a trend where renewable sources are becoming increasingly cheaper, so long as we can deal with the variability issue. Uh, and uh, that I think is, is where the hydrogen becomes important and all the, also the other opportunities for storage. Uh, if I could, um, one of the things I find uh, intriguing about uh, the Japan story is that in some sense, uh, Japan has made the, is making this uh, very strong commitment to a, to a hydrogen uh, future, I think, which is, which, is, which is wonderful. But then at the same time, Japan is uh, making a commitment to importing a significant fraction of the hydrogen that it will use, either in the form of ammonia or some of the other other uh, possibilities. Um, you know, I mentioned the fact that off offshore wind is is now competitive uh, with uh, other sources of electricity in parts of Europe. In Scotland, for example, is a major producer of electricity from offshore wind. Um, uh, offshore wind is going to become a significant factor, uh, economically viable factor for uh, parts of the offshore region of, of Massachusetts and uh, and Rhode Island. As I think we mentioned, we have this paper that was published recently looking at the significant opportunity for offshore wind to produce com cost competitive electricity in China. What I wanted to, the point I wanted to make is that offshore wind is probably not competitive in Japanese uh, uh, territorial waters because the water gets deep pretty fast. But it'd be wonderful if in fact there was a cooperation agreement between uh, China and Japan and also Korea for that matter where in fact uh, cheap electricity from offshore wind could be used to export uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to Japan or to have joint activities to produce hydrogen for both, uh, both communities. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think seeing as we, we, we had uh, some comments on, on, on Mo Monica Nagashima's presentation, it would be right to just go straight to Monica and, and say, what, what, do you, what do you think about the drivers for why is, well, firstly, we can understand why why the import led strategy is is currently favoured. That's interesting, but the uh, perhaps the the different attitudes to other places of uh, using grey or 
or or other forms of hydrogen and how do you think that do you think that's a transition fuel or do you think that's um do you, do you think that kind of reflects japanese policy sure um thank you thank you for the comments and for the questions um i think i'd like to address the first point about um the current approach um and Japan has notably struggled to reduce the cost of domestic renewables, be it solar, onshore wind. And uh, right now, a bidding process has started for offshore wind projects, and um, Japanese companies have formed collaborations with uh, some of the notable Western uh, European companies to um, develop these. So uh, there's hope, and of course, there is some potential that, so as was noted by Professor um, at Elroy, there are some technical challenges, deep water, a lot, lots of typhoons. Um, but indeed, um, given that the shortening, if we can shorten the distance of transport of hydrogen and uh, produce it more locally in the region and some of the neighboring countries, um, that would reduce the costs for import to Japan. And um, quite interestingly, um, I was fascinated to, to listen to the presentation about production possibilities in China, in Inner Mongolia. Um, so I, I believe the, the current pilots that we have um, you know, are more meant to develop these shipping technologies. You know, this is kind of a first time for all of these companies. So they're still trying to see how the liquefaction process works, how the loading, how the shipping, the storage is going to be. But uh, in a few years time, the, the hope is that these technologies can be dispatched all over the world and wherever there is a port, they could just pick up the hydrogen and bring it to Japan. And um, uh, the rest would be kind of up to economics. So um, just also answering the comments um, from someone about possibilities of producing hydrogen from China. Um, absolutely, I, I do think there, there's uh, good potential there. And uh, also just one last point on cooperation. Um, Toyota this year has um, formed a joint venture with I believe six manufacturers with automakers in China to develop fuel cells for cars. So uh, I definitely think that hydrogen and fuel cell um, cooperation um, is, uh, is going to move forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just to kind of move on from this question a, li a little bit, um, and um, I just wanted to bring in Sam um, Perez on. Um, you've obviously, the, the plant you're proposing or is in development is, is kind of an example of a sort of hyper-local plant where you're, you're locating right next to the, uh, the end user. Uh, but I can see there's obviously some advantages to that. And I, and I wondered to what extent do you see that being a viable strategy going forward? Are there enough end users uh, either around that plant for expansion or in, in, uh, in other, uh, around other places that you've identified? Uh, and also, how do you see the economics of transport affecting um, affecting the viability of, of kind of scaling up the industry going forward? Yeah, sorry. We are at the very beginning of the developing of the green hydrogen, but uh, from the market studies we, we made, um, the fertilizer company we are partnering is 20% of the hydrogen demand of the whole country. So we just cover with this uh, 20 megawatts facility that will be one of the biggest in Europe, just the 2% of the hydrogen demand of one of its uh, facilities. Uh, so we think there is a still room for, for increasing the capacity of electrolyzers, just looking at uh, decarbonizing the, the production of ammonia. And of course, with the experience we will gain with, uh, with these installations, we can go to other uh, industries, uh, chemical industry, methanol industry, and other uh, lower demanding hydrogen like electronics or, or whatever. 
but uh, we think just starting with a huge client that assure the of taking of the of the hydrogen is a is a, a clear advantage at the moment of developing this green hydrogen. I, I was also interested, Sam, to see that you've got storage at your plant, but not storage of hydrogen. Instead, it's storage in the form of batteries. Yeah, um, so it, was, um, it was to to be sure that the um, electric feed to the electrolyzer is is a stable. It's not only to imp to increase the production, but uh, but also to to uh, the, to increase the the stability of the of the electricity. Um, uh, also, we we decided to use for this initial project uh, a PEM technology, the proton exchange uh, membrane technology, because of the footprint of this technology is lower than the alkaline technology, and we were limited in the space inside the Fertiberia facility. So this is uh, some some small decisions we we needed to take during the development the developing of the of the project just to address uh, some difficulties at the, the, from the practical point of view. Mm. I, I, I just also like to ask one more question to, in, in fact, this time to uh, Professor McElroy, and then after this, I think we're gonna uh, just have some final words and wrap up. Um, so the, the final question was about storage, which we, we, we were just talking about there with, um, with Sam. But the, so you, you talked about your studies looking at the ability of energies of storage to kind of reduce the curtailment of wind. And I wondered what you think the key challenges are for storage of, 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 of hydrogen um, or, and also how that relates to kind of keeping electrolyzers operating consistently. So maybe if you could say a, a few words on, on storage of hydrogen itself. Yes, uh, I, I think that uh, if one of the things that I think has been very interesting in, in the presentations here is that um, we haven't had a lot of, we haven't sort of spent a lot of time thinking about how you transport hydrogen. And we know that that could be fairly expensive. I mean, the beauty here is that if you're, that if, if you're using electricity to produce hydrogen, the electricity can be transported more easily than the hydrogen can. So. In fact, using uh, facilities uh, where you have the electrolyzers as the opportunity to, to make use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, electricity is I think uh, the better uh, idea uh, from, from my point of view at least. Um, in terms of storage, in, in terms of uh, storage, I think that um, imagining a world where we are using either large fraction of electricity from wind or a large fraction from the sun or a combination of both. Then um, if we have, if we, if we interconnect regions, I mean, for example, in the case of the United States, there are actually three un unconnected uh, power grids, East Coast, West Coast, and Texas. If you have a national um, interconnected uh, grid, then you can get rid of some of the uh, variability problems because the sun may be shining in one place and not in another, wind blowing someplace, not, not blowing another. But you still probably will, will, will need to have, um, to have short term uh, storage. Uh, batteries uh, provide an opportunity to do that. Lithium ion batteries clearly cost coming down, but the flow batteries, a uh, potential uh, uh, opportunity for the future as well. And then if you think about uh, countries like uh, India, for example, where India has significant uh, wind resources and significant uh, solar resources as well. But the wind blows primarily during the monsoon season and is relatively low at other uh, times of the year. So once again, you have the question of how do you balance production where, where during the monsoon season, it might be in excess of demand, but then you have a deficiency at other times. So uh, the overall planning of the system, I think is the biggest challenge that we, that we really face. The other, the other point, if I could just uh, make another point, I think that we're, we're all obviously focused uh, particularly on the, on the climate issue, on the need to decarbonize the, the global economy. But the other thought I have is that this is also an opportunity for us to, to, uh, to cut into local problems that are also causing difficulties, uh, political difficulties, social difficulties. So if I think about for East Asia, Obviously, there, there are some sensitivities between Japan and Korea, sensitivity between Korea and, and, uh, and China, sensitivity between 
uh, Japan and, um, and, and China. To the extent that you develop a, uh, a hydrogen electricity renewable market with cooperation between those three countries, maybe you can reduce some of the other problems. So I think there's the opportunity here to cut into uh, cut into uh, instabilities might otherwise arise, not just to deal with the climate issue, but to deal with local problems. Thank you. That's a, that's a nice note to end on as well of the potential for hydrogen to kind of reduce some of the geopolitical tensions that, that might otherwise be the case. So that's a very positive uh, thought to end on. And, and unfortunately, it will have to be the thought we end on. Um, we've um, had a lot of very interesting discussion. I hope you'll agree. I thank you. I thank to all the panelists for their interesting presentations. Um, and I also have to remind everyone that there's a transport session starting right now. I've in included a link in the chat to it. And also, if you've registered, you should have already received a link to join that session. So all that remains for me to do is to finally thank all our excellent panelists again, um, and to thank all the attendees and participants and the organizers as well. Um, so thank you very much. There will be a recording of this session available and also we'll be publishing a, a kind of a paper that will be, include most of the materials from the background paper with some conclusions and learnings from the webinars themselves. So thanks again, everyone, and um, looking forward to, to as many as, as possible joining the, the next session. And then, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch in due course. So thank you very much, everyone. Good night.